Hi everyone, welcome to Biology 360 Genetics. I'm your instructor, Dr. Dave Keller, and uh, as talked about in lecture on Monday, the uh, course is actually a flipped classroom approach where you will be watching videos ahead of time, which will be about 10 minutes or so, and then you'll be coming into class and we'll be doing some exercises and some other problems uh, to help reinforce that material. So I'm excited for the new semester and I hope you are too. Uh, I just want to let you know there's a couple things coming up this week. One is there's a survey that's through Blackboard Learn, and I'll be explaining a little bit more about that in uh, in lecture. Okay. Uh, you can find the textbook either online or you can buy it through the bookstore. Uh, remember to sign up for a discussion, and those of you who have questions about enrollment and discussion, just talk to me or talk to the instructor and leader, Dr. Bell. And uh, let's go ahead and get started. So this lecture is on the DNA structure, and it's found in chapter uh, 2 of your iGenetics textbook, and it's pages 15 to 20. So let's start out with a little genetics humor. It says the focus group was vehemently opposed to genetically altered corn and wheat, but they love chocolate-flavored lettuce. And who doesn't love chocolate-flavored lettuce? So the format of this lecture is going to be that I'm going to give you present to you about four or so questions. These are multiple choice questions that will show up on a quiz later on. And then um, I will not be giving the answers in the lecture, in the video, but instead we will be doing these as uh, clicker questions during the class, in which, at which point you will be um, answering them and then being scored for them. Okay, so these questions are designed to help you uh, get the most out of this online video and they will be answered in the online video. Okay, so first question, uh, which of the following structures is a deoxyribonucleotide? Feel free to pause the video if you want more time to look at it. I'm gonna be moving on though. Question number two, which of the following is or are true of DNA and RNA? Question number three, which of the following bonds represents the phosphodiester bond? And finally, question number four. The inverse complement of the following DNA sequence would be what? All right, let's get started. So again, this material comes from chapter two in the iGenetics textbook. You can also find more information on the Blackboard Learn site. There's a sec there's a a link on the left-hand column called Learning Modules, and there's a learning module called DNA, and a lot of this material will be found in that learning module. So if you want to get some more information, also links to outside websites, web sources and, re and other resources, uh, that's where you can go. All right, so uh, the first picture here shows a molecule of DNA, uh, sorry, of a nucleotide. The structure of a nucleotide contains three components. The one on the left here is the phosphate group, the one in the middle is the sugar, and the one on the right here is the base. In this case, it's adenine. A couple of nomenclature uh, things I want to let you know about. The, the word nucleotide refers to all three together, whereas the word nucleoside, shown down here, contains just the sugar and the base together. So when you put the phosphate on it, now it becomes a nucleotide. Let's break these down into the component parts. First off, the sugar. As you can see, the sugar is very similar between DNA on the left and RNA on the right. DNA, the sugar is deoxyribose, and you'll see here that one of the carbons is missing a hydroxyl group, the OH group. Instead, it's just a, a single H. So it's deoxy or without oxygen. The carbons are numbered beginning at the anomeric carbon here, which is this one on the right-hand side. We call this the one prime carbon and then it goes to the two prime carbon where the absence of the hydroxyl or OH group is found the three prime carbon, the four prime carbon, and then finally the five prime carbon which is outside the ring. RNA on the other hand the sugar is ribose and this is the same structure except that the two prime carbon is attached to an OH or a hydroxyl group. So you'll be getting a chance to draw these kinds of things in the discussion this week. The next component I wanted to talk about was the base, the nitrogenous base. And of course there are two flavors of these, the purines, which are the double ring structures, and the pyrimidines, which are the single ring. These are also numbered, 
1 through 9 in the case of purines, and 1 through 6 in the case of pyrimidines. The structures of purines are shown here, adenine and guanine. Notice that the, the overall ring structure is very similar, but the side groups are a little different, which gives it the unique chemistry. So adenine has this amine group, this NH2 group. Guanine, on the other hand, has a carbonyl group here on position 6, and the amine group here on position number 2. The pyrimidines, same idea, one ring, but slightly different chemistry, so slightly different structures. Cytosines have an, an amine group, uracils, found in RNA only, have a carbonyl, and thiamines have this carbonyl, but they also contain a CH3 or methyl group. When we talk about the bases that we just showed, uh, we refer to them as adenine, or A, guanine, or G, cytosine, or C, thymine, or T, or uracil, or U. However, if you talk about the nucleoside, which is the base plus the sugar, then we give it a new name. In the case of DNA nucleosides, we call them deoxyadenosine, or deoxyguanosine, or deoxycytidine, or deoxythymidine. RNA nucleosides are similar, though we don't add the deoxy in front. So the ribose plus the base would be adenosine, or A, guanosine, or G, cytosine, cytidine, or C, or uridine, U. So the, no, the names change a little bit, whether you're talking about the base only, or if you're talking about the base plus the sugar together. If you're talking about all three, the base and the sugar and the phosphate, then it becomes a nucleotide. Another way you can describe this is a nucleoside, which, remember, is the sugar and the base, with a single phosphate, or a monophosphate. So this structure here is deoxyadenosine, 5' prime monophosphate. The quick way to show that is with the acronym D, little d, AMP, deoxyadenosine monophosphate. And then it's a simple matter if you're adding an additional phosphate. For example, here, you just call it, instead of mono, you call it diphosphate. Or here in the case of three phosphates, you call it triphosphate. Bases, sorry, nucleotides can be linked together uh, through the three prime carbon hydroxyl group and the five prime carbon phosphate group. So this bond, when it is formed, is called a phosphodiester bond. There are two phosphoester bonds here. The phosphoester bond is the carbon, the three prime carbon, plus the oxygen, plus the phosphorus atom. That's phosphoester bond one. The second one is the five prime carbon, the oxygen, and the phosphate, phosphorus. That's phosphoester bond two. So together there are two phosphoester bonds or a phosphodiester bond. And those link the nucleotides together. The structure of DNA, though, was discovered by using physical techniques, for example, X-ray crystallography. X-ray crystallography is a technique where you bombard a molecule, a crystal in this case, with uh, high-energy X-ray beams. And this picture on the left is an X-ray film of what a diffraction pattern of DNA looks like. Uh, the lady scientist who, uh, who uh, developed this film is shown here, Rosalind Franklin, and she was working with, uh, with Maurice Wilkins in the 1950s to identify the structure of DNA. And if you want to learn more about this structure and more about Rosalind uh, Franklin, uh, go check out the learning module. The DNA learning module has a link to a website that talks about that structure. These two guys here you may recognize. It's James Watson on the left and Francis Crick on the right. They received the Nobel Prize in the 1950s for discovering the structure of the double helix using the structure, uh, using the X-ray crystallography data from Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin. Maurice Wilkins also won the Nobel Prize, but Rosalind Franklin uh, tragically died before the Nobel Prize could be given out. So they uh, determined uh, the structure of the double helix. And here it is. So the yellow are the phosphorus atoms, and together the yellow and the red make the phosphate group that we saw in the previous slides. Um, the black here are the carbons, 
and then the blue would represent the bases. And you'll notice that from the overall structure of the DNA double helix that there is a right-handed helix. So if you take your right hand and curl your fingers around, that's the direction that the helix is going, and the finger points, uh, the thumb points up in that case, so it's a right-handed helix. The phosphates are on the outside, whereas the bases are on the inside. The diameter of a double helix, if you looked straight down the middle, would be about two nanometers. So here you see the radius is one nanometer. The periodicity, meaning how, what's the helical turn uh, to make a, what's the, what's the distance to make a complete helical turn, is about 10 uh, steps or 10 bases and it's about 3.4 nanometers, as shown here on the right-hand side. Notice that the, uh, there's base pairing, we'll talk about that in a minute. And finally, notice that there's a so-called major groove, which is the wider space here, and the so-called minor groove, which is the narrower space here. Here's a zoom-in of the hydrogen bonding. So the bases are laid flat, kind of like uh, steps on a ladder, and uh, T's, or thymines, will bond through hydrogen bonding to A's, or adenines. T's and A's have two hydrogen bonds, as shown here. You have a hydrogen bond donor, uh, this amine group, and the hydrogen bond acceptor, this carbonyl, and the hydrogen bond uh, donor and hydrogen bond acceptor. And these stabilize the double helix. The hydrogen bonds are kind of weak. They're about a thousandfold uh, weaker than a covalent bond, which is represented by solid lines here. However, DNA is very large, and so many hydrogen bonds, uh, all being weak, will still hold it together quite well. Cytosines and guanines are a little bit more stable in the sense that they are formed by that they are bounded together by three hydrogen bonds, not two. So a strand of DNA has a particular order. It begins with, by convention, with the phosphate and the five prime carbon, and ends with the hydroxyl group and the three prime carbon. So the order of the letters are important. For example, you can't read English backwards and make sense out of it. Read row is not the same as order. Here we have a sequence of bases reading from five prime carbon to three prime carbon. We read it T G T A. And that sequence has a specific meaning. If you were to read it backwards, it wouldn't mean the same thing. Here are some ways to picture or to draw out the, the sequence of the bases. In this particular slide, the five prime carbon begins with the base C, C A G C, and that's how I've written it here at the top. There are three H bonds connecting that C with that G, two H bonds connecting the A and the T, and so on. So I've drawn one strand, which we're going to refer to as the top strand, and the other one is the bottom strand. Notice the two strands are uh, in opposite directions, meaning 5' prime to 3', prime, and then 3' prime to 5'. Prime. We call that anti-parallel. DNA, when we say DNA is anti-parallel, we mean that the two strands are going in opposite directions. However, as long as you maintain that 5' prime and 3' prime direction, you can flip that sequence around and it's the same thing. For example, this sequence here on top is the same one as the one in the middle. Here's another way to write it just without the H bonds included. I've simplified that writing here on top. Now I'm just drawing the top strand. Because DNA is governed by that base pairing rule, we can assume that the bottom strand is going to be the, um, the G, T, C, G without having to write it. So you can get the information of the bottom strand just by knowing what one of the what the top strand is. If we were to write just the bottom strand by itself, we call that the complement. So here is the complement written in the three prime to five prime direction. However, if we reverse the order and we write it the complement in the five prime to three prime direction, we call that the inverse complement or sometimes the reverse complement. 